My guest today is a theologian, writer, and fishing lure designer. He also is the director of Perichoresis Ministries. He's a native of Prentice, Mississippi. He and his wife, Beth, have been married for 30 years and have four children. A lifelong student of psychology, he has degrees in political science, divinity, and earned his Ph.D. from the King's College, Aberdeen University in Aberdeen, Scotland, under Professor James B. Torrance. He is the author of eight books, including The Great Dance, Jesus and the Undoing of Adam, and Across All Worlds, the international bestseller The Shack Revisited, and his most recent book is Patmos. He has recently written a powerful essay on the mediation of Jesus Christ that I look forward to unpacking with him today. He teaches around the world. He's an avid outdoorsman and holds two United States patents for his fishing lure designs. He's also the founder and president of Mediator Lures. Welcome to the Messy Spirituality Podcast, Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. I know for me, the Trinity, which is so much a part of your work, uh, was just like a divine pecking order. Growing up, I thought of God on top, the subservient son, Jesus. I had no idea whatsoever to do with the Holy Spirit. But there was this God and Jesus, good cop, bad cop routine. That's really who I thought God was until you know I was 40 years old. How did you come to see the Trinity the way you do now? Because it's so beautiful and it's, it's such a part of your work. Yeah, you know, that was sort of implicit all along for me, but I, it became primarily through uh, reading Athanasius and then Torrance's and then Karl Barth. And then in, in that process and C.S. Lewis and uh, and many others, but but that was the the basic thing. I knew it was important. Didn't know what it was, but when when um, this my son's now thirty two or thirty three, um, and he has his his own son. But when he was seven years old, um, six somewhere right in there, it was a Saturday afternoon, and uh, I was getting I was sorting through junk mail, sitting on the couch, getting ready to watch an Ole Miss football game. And I looked to my, I noticed movement to my far right, and I looked over and down toward the floor. I saw two camouflage faces and camouflage hat, and then I heard these screams and these two camouflage blurs decked out. I mean, they had on the shirts, uh, camouflage pants, boots, they had plastic guns and knives and grenades, and two of them just flying through there, and they, they hit me, and we went into this mock battle. And uh, grenades going off, machine gun. You know they were playing army, and and uh, and after about ten minutes, I was exhausted. And I remember <laughs> we ended up we ended up in a in a pile of laughter on the floor, all three of us. And I I got up on my hands and knees, and I heard. Well, it was, it was more of a ticker tape, but I heard it too. Um, pay attention, this is important. And I thought, well, oh, oh, why? Okay. What, what, what's so extraordinary about this? I mean, it's got to be going on all over the world. The dad and his, his son and his buddy playing in the den, I mean, Saturday afternoon. And and, and so I, it took me a while to process, and then I realized, hang on just a second. Uh, I didn't even know this other little boy. In fact, I didn't even know he was in my house. I'd never even seen him. Didn't know his name. And just suppose for sake of discussion that, that my son was back in the back playing with our dog, Nessie. And this other little boy would have walked into my den decked out in camouflage. He wouldn't even known for sure that I was Mr. Kruger. He probably would have guessed that. But the last thing on earth that's going to happen is him to come flying through the air and engage me in that kind of personal familiarity because he doesn't know me, doesn't know what I'm like, doesn't know my heart. And then, then it hit me. And man, did it ever hit me. My son was there. And my son knows me. And he knows that I not only love him, he knows that I like him, that I want to be with him. And so in the freedom of his knowledge of my heart, he did the most natural thing in the world, which is to engage me in play. And his buddy was right in the middle of it with him. And I watched my son's knowledge of me, my son's freedom with me, my son's communion, if you want to put it that way with me, go inside that other little boy. And he got to share it. In fact, it became as much his as it was ours in that in that moment. And I'm standing there in, in my den all those years ago, and I thought, that is the gospel. 
Jesus says, no one knows the Father but the Son. And I have come to share with you what I know. And in order for you to experience this, you're going to have to let me make some pretty serious adjustments to your thinking, Baxter. So to me, the, the doctrine of the Trinity um, was always beautiful, but it, become, it became much more concrete for me in that moment because I realized a lot more about what John is saying in his gospel, what Jesus is saying, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. And I, I neglected to say this in John 17, 26. My favorite part of that verse right now is the, is, is the, the phrase, I will. I have made you known, Father, and I will make you known. He takes responsibility for finding his bride in her darkness and revealing his father and life in this father's house uh, to his bride. It's his, he's the good shepherd. He comes and finds us. He brings us home. And the Holy Spirit reveals what he is. It's done. It's finished. This is reality. And we've been walking around in dark. So it was both a, a personal journey for me and also theological. But theologically, um, the Torrance brothers had the most to do with that. I remember J.B. talking, uh, Professor James Torrance talking about it all the time. And um, I mean, he, he just he would say every day, you know, every time you'd see him, he would say, the heart of the New Testament is the relationship of the Father and Son. The heart of the New Testament is the relationship of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. He would just say that again and again and again. And it's like after a while, it sinks in, and you begin to realize how significant this is. If you start out with the Trinity, you understand the purpose of creation and redemption. If you start out with a single person, you don't know why God created us, except for maybe he was bored or needed us somebody to glorify him. So that 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 was one of the one of the things that Professor James Torrance said all the time that rocked me in, in a beautiful way. And I wanted to hear it. I was there because I knew he would be saying that and I wanted to learn from him. And the other thing that he said all the time, um, it, this, <laughs> he got this from Calvin, that forgiveness is logically prior to repentance. And I asked him one time, I said, Professor Tarts, you do realize that that one statement, that forgiveness is prior to repentance just shatters North American evangelical thought. He said, oh dear, oh dear, yes, yes. And um, so I've modified his statement, uh, as, as students do. I've added the word union. I got this from Lewis Burkhoff, uh, page 447 in his Systematic Theology, which is a Reformed uh, theologian. Union with Christ is prior to faith and repentance. Now, that's the very best of the Reformed tradition. They believe that to be true only for the elect. And I believe it's true only for the elect. It's just <laughs> election is Jesus and all creation in him, but union with Christ. This is John 14, 20. In that day, you will know, you will know, you will come to discover something is true before you believe it. You will come to see that I am one with my Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. This is the truth that you come to know. It sets you free from your delusions, whether it's religious or secular delusions. Union with Christ is prior to our knowing or believing or repenting. Beautiful. So it, it dramatically changes the nature of those things, which then lines up with what Paul and John are talking about by believing you believe what is. As Luther said, faith is like the eye. It doesn't create what it sees. It sees what is there. And what is there is I'm in my Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. Now, let's get on with the business of rethinking everything we thought we knew in the light of Jesus and living in freedom and being healed. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you have written recently this beautiful essay on the mediation of Jesus Christ. 
why did you take the time to do that? I mean, you've posted it on your website. It's about what, 23 pages long with footnotes. What, what inspired that? What did you decide you wanted to get out there through this essay to give it away for free on your website like that? Yeah, it's gone right around the world in, 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 in a month. And then Michael and has done a beautiful six or seven minute uh, promo video to it, um, all of which is available on our website and for free. Uh, this, this is a life. I've got two life essays. Uh, this is the first one. This is a theological one uh, that's basically summarizing my journey and my life and what I see, uh, where we lost the plot, where we went off the beam. And I wanted to proclaim what I believe is the real New Testament Jesus, the apostolic vision of Jesus Christ. And I wanted to, to write about it in such a way that, that people can understand and see the implications of it. And I want it to be all in one place. And not an overwhelming 700-page book, but like, okay, here it is all in one place. I can sit down and read this. And it's mind-boggling. It's beautiful. I cried all the way through writing it. Every time I pick it up and read it, I cry. But it, it's simply a lot about what we've been talking about is that um, John says that Jesus is face-to-face with the Father and that all things were created in him. That's what Paul says in Colossians and Hebrews says also. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6 and other places. Um, all things were created in Him. So first is the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, where we have failed in, in much of Western thought, not all, uh, by, by any means, but where, where we lost the plot is that we haven't thought through or we haven't held together the fact that Jesus is the eternal Father's eternal Son of the Father, that He's the one anointed in the Holy Spirit from all eternity, and He is the creator and sustainer of all things. He holds all things into being all the time. Without Him, we'd simply uh, cease to be, as Calvin said, as, as many said, Athanasius and others. We haven't held these three realities together with the Incarnation, to, so that when you encounter the man Jesus, the incarnate Son, you're looking at the Father's eternal Son and the one uh, who's anointed in the Holy Spirit and the one who's created and sustains all things. So in him, in Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit, creation, and the human race are together in relationship. He, Jesus is the relationship. So what happens uh, to, I mean, when he became a human being, he didn't leave his father behind. He didn't say, thanks, Holy Spirit, for the power trip, but I'm going to do this in my own strength. He became human in the Spirit as the Father's Son, as the creator and sustainer of all things. So the simple question, once you sort that through and you're holding that together in the, in, in the very identity of Jesus, is what happens to creation and what happens to the human race if he dies? Because we don't, creation is not like the ever ready energizer bunny where God just gives us all our individual little battery packs and, and something could happen to God and we'd keep right on, you know, doing our thing. We, we breathe Christological air. We exist and live and have our being in Jesus. Without him, we would perish. We would vanish. We would lapse into non being, as Athanasius says. So, what happens to us when Jesus dies? And the Apostle Paul is beside him, said, I'll tell you what happens to us when Jesus died. When he died, we died. When he rose, we were quickened to life and rose with him. When he ascended to the Father, we ascended in him, into the Father's arms and into the world of the Holy Spirit. So what, what does that mean? It means Pentecost, the pouring out. If the Word became flesh and we died in the Word and rose with the Word, and ascended in the Word, what does that mean? It means the Holy Spirit is now poured out on all flesh. It means in that day you will know that I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. The Holy Spirit has been given to us to open our eyes, to see, to understand, to walk in this. So that's what the paper is about. And, and then it raises the question, what then is faith? What is repentance? What is heaven? What is hell? So the light of Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and all of theology, every single bit of theology, no matter what, uh, bit you're talking about, eschatology, election, uh, sin, salvation, hell, adoption, whatever uh, eschatology, or whatever part you talk about, it all should be a footnote to the identity of Jesus as the Father's eternal Son, uh, the Anointed One, as the Creator and Sustainer of all things, crucified, resurrected, and ascended. Everything that we say the, in all of theology is bound in that statement. It's a matter of unpacking all the volumes 
that are bound in the very identity of Jesus. That's the task of Christian theology. That's the joy of it, is that we're not, we're not talking about something that's not real, that we have to make real. We're talking about what is real, and we're discovering it and unpacking the implications, and it blows everybody's mind. It's exactly what Paul said it was going to do. Exactly what Jesus you know, and, and the apostles are saying. So that, that essay is, is a great joy to my heart, and I wanted to give it to the world. I want it to, I want it to, uh, I want everybody to ask, even if you disagree with every single word of it, I want them to ask the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is, this paper is my answer. Um, and I'm working on a second paper, which is kind of a life's work that's, uh, uh, the meaning of the death of Jesus in John's gospel, uh, which is just breathtaking. Well, I'm looking forward to that as well. You uh, you say in the essay, to speak of Jesus is to say something about the being of God, about all creation and the whole human race. In your mind, you know, Richard Rohr came out with a book a couple of years ago called The Universal Christ, and he distinguishes between Jesus of Nazareth and, you know, kind of a Christ, the King of Kings, the universal Lord. I don't see that same distinction in this essay. Um, w- would you differ from Rohr on that? Yes, I would. Uh- um, uh, the only access to what he's calling the universal Christ we have is Jesus of Nazareth. And there is, there are not two Jesuses. There's not an eternal word. And then Jesus, Jesus is the eternal word and he is the creator and the sustainer. And so it's much more. And I, and I say that with all due respect to Richard, cause he, uh, he has done a wonderful job at helping us understand the practicalities of union. But on that point, I do I do differ from him, and I'm, I would say that I'm I'm much more with Athanasius, and he he tends to see it seems like I don't know I I'd have to talk to him, uh, but he tends to see the incarnation as an instance of what's true of all, that we're all incarnations of God, um, and I would be much more Christological than that, the incarnation is the truth, and we're participating in Jesus of Nazareth's existence as the resurrected, ascended uh, Lord of all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Anointing One. So these are uh, simple distinctions, but rather large, as you put your finger on something I think is critical. I don't know God except what Jesus teaches us. So I don't start off with the view of God that we've derived either from the Bible or just what makes sense to us, because um, what we have, according to John 16, according to Jesus in John 16, you know, we, we have a sinful view of sin and a blind view of blindness. So Jesus, you got to teach us about who who is God who teaches Jesus. So he immediately goes to Father, Holy Spirit, and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that's all we know about God from Jesus. But we're certainly free to invent our own theologies, but uh, who who really wants to do that when you can talk to the Father's eternal Son and He can lead us, <laughs> and, he, and He has. So right. the, the the question to me um, on that is, we are free to continue to play church as long as we want, uh, but that is simply to limit ourselves to ourselves. It is to limit the kingdom to be what we can create, or we can say to Jesus. I don't know how to define church. I don't know how to define kingdom. Would you teach me? And I want to share in your life with your Father and the Holy Spirit. And I want to see everybody the way you see them, Jesus. I want to see through your eyes. I want to know with your mind. I want to feel with your feelings. My son's buddy found out later his name was Stephen. What what would happen if if we suddenly had that room on Saturday afternoon lapsed right back into religion? Would be Stephen would would jump up and he would pull out a piece of paper and he'd write down. What does it look like to have a relationship with Mr. Kruger? Well, let's see. Baxter Jr. stands this way. He cocks his head this way. He says these words. Uh, And so you begin a process of imitating what you think it would look like as opposed to actually participating in the relationship. Uh, That's the difference between religious, external religion, as I call it, and participation. But it's participation in the one son's personhood in his relation. It's not, uh, I'm not, a. he's not an example of us to follow. 
He is the life shared with us. So I, I, that would be a fascinating discussion to have with Richard. I was, I was a bit surprised by that, but, you know, um, he's a very bright and seasoned veteran walking with Jesus. So you, 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 you criticize people like that very lightly. Of course, absolutely. Well, and he's got such a gracious spirit about it. It's hard to, yeah, <laughs> it's hard exactly. to take a mean spirited approach to Richard Rohr, right? But but we can talk about the distinctions in our our theology. Well, I always say that that we're meant to wrestle with ideas and be critical of ideas, uh, but we're not ever to say anything about persons, right? Um, so he's a beloved son as. We are, and uh, this is an idea that I don't quite understand, and I, I don't share. Uh, I want to anchor this in the single person of the Son, in His indivisible oneness with His Father and the Holy Spirit. All right, back to the essay. You you say specifically by yielding to our enraged will, Jesus, the Mediator of creation, became both the great exis, Exodus, the Lamb lifting away the crushing weight of our catastrophic idolatry, and Heaven's Gate, the true temple where the life of the triune God takes up and holds the fallen human race and all creation in its brokenness. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? That's such a powerful statement. Yeah, that's straight from John's gospel. The heaven's gate part is John 151 and uh, Jacob's ladder. And uh, But the point that I'm making, the overarching point is that, that what happens on the cross is not sinners in the hands of an angry God, it's God in the hands of angry sinners, and particularly the Son. And where was God the Father on, in this moment when uh, the human race, not the Father, but the human race was pouring out our wrath on Jesus, uh, our unbelief, our treachery, our covenant breaking, our apostasy? Where was the Father? God, as Paul says, God was in Christ, reconciling the world. So the it's the son who goes to the cross and he's in the Father and the Father's in him and so is the Holy Spirit and they submit themselves to the, I'll call it the catastrophic idolatry, the catastrophic blindness, the deception, the ignorance of the human race and we pour out our wrath, we beat him, we to within an inch of his life we rejected him, we cursed, we damned the word of God and what is the Father doing in this moment? He is accepting our will, and He's transforming our rejection and our murder of His Son into the new covenant. He is in Jesus affirming Himself at, as He's always been as our Father, and He is in Jesus redeeming our most stupid, uh, blasphemous blunder and renewing his union with us in his son through our rejection of his son. And it's not our belief, it's our unbelief. Uh, we are Caiaphas, the one high priest in history. Or in Caiaphas, we as the human race uh, sacrificed the one true offering, and we did it for the wrong reason, and we did it without knowing what we were really doing. And the father said, I will accept your murder of my son. I will accept it, and I will transform your murder of my son into the mercy seat, the place where I embrace you and accept you in my son at your very worst as my creation, as my children, and I will affirm my fatherhood and your and your uh, sonship or daughtership in, in this moment. And, and I, and the Holy Spirit is saying, and I am in Jesus, and and... And um, Irenaeus, to quote him again, it's beautiful. Several places he uses this language of the Holy Spirit accustoming himself to dwell with us uh, in the journey of Jesus' incarnation all the way to the cross. Uh, and he says the same thing about God the Father, but it's pointed about the Holy Spirit because on the penal substitutionary model for Pete's sake— the Father turns his back on the Son. I mean, come on. And so what's the Holy Spirit doing? While the Father's enraged and pouring out his wrath on the Son and turning his back and abandoning his own Son, what's the Holy Spirit doing? It's torn, you know, like trying to hold on to both. It's just an insanity. 
uh, in our in our fallen mind. So what's really going on is the is that in the Son, the Father and the Holy Spirit are meeting us at our worst, and the Holy Spirit is transforming my idolatry into the temple where she dwells, and she's going to turn the lights on. And so it's so powerful and so beautiful, and this is what John is screaming at us all the way through his gospel. I mean, uh, here's here's an, just a quick example. John chapter 2, Jesus cleans the temple. Uh, in the Synoptic Gospel, the cleansing of the temple is at the end of Jesus' ministry. In John's, it's at the beginning. And it's not it's not hard to figure out why. Is that John is the old veteran and he he's watching, he sees, he sees Israel. So in 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 the what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew story, you have the Lord on one side and you got Abraham slash Israel on the other. I will be your God, you will be my people. And you, we'll walk together in, 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 in great blessing. And so all the way through, Israel fails. All the way through, they're faithless. All the way through, they reject God. They don't want to have anything to do with this. They want the blessing, but not the relationship. And so finally, the Lord says, and I will make a new covenant, and I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart, a real heart, and I will cause you to walk in my ways. And not, not only that, but I'm going to put my spirit within you. So you have this covenant relationship between the Lord on one side, Israel on the other, and these promises. And John is standing there watching this, you know, after thinking about this moment of Jesus cleansing the temple after, I mean, how many ever years, decades, he's been preaching and teaching. And he's just, you can feel his joy. He's like, oh, my goodness. Now the Father's Son has come on Israel's side of the covenant relationship, and the Father's Son is in the temple, and what's he doing? He's cleaning house. And not only cleaning house, he's now filling the covenant with his own zeal and love for his Father. So into the covenant relationship of the Lord on one side and Israel on the other, you have the Father-Son relationship in the Holy Spirit descending, creating a new covenant relationship in the person of the Son, and we're included in His relationship. And you can feel John's joy because it's it's like, well, one of the first times that, it's probably 10, 12 years ago now when I first met Paul Young, and um, we were traveling and lecturing together on, on the shack, and, and uh, I always got a kick out of it because Paul would They'd introduce him. He'd walk up, and you could see in his face, you could see Paul Young standing there because he knew that he knew something that we didn't know, but we were about to know it, about to discover it. And Paul had this great sense of joy about him as he got to participate in the unveiling, and we were going to see and know, and he knew what would happen to us when we saw it. And that's John. John knows who Jesus is. He knows that we don't know who he is. And so from the very beginning, he is expanding our imaginations. He's messing with our theology. He's, he's deconstructing and reconstructing in all these little ways so that all of a sudden we too can see Jesus in the temple, just like it was prophesied. And he's cleaning the house and he's re, reconfiguring it. And he is the temple where God and, and humanity meet in our brokenness and to see the picture that in Jesus, the father's reaching down and embracing us at our very worst and holding us in his arms. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you, I am going, I've made you known father and I will make you known in order that the love with which you love me may be in them. And, and I, and they can see what I see and feel what I feel. We've got them. We've got them. So the discovery of Christian faith is not that, that I have correctly believed enough. And as Paul Young always talks about, the, who's got the believo meter? <laughs> that I've struck a high mark on the believo meter. Now, now I'm, quote, saved. That the discovery of Christian faith is that my father accepted me while I was murdering his son. And he turned it into affirmation of his union with me in Jesus. Oh, my goodness me. That's faith that heals the soul and delivers us from the evil of worthlessness and not good enoughness to see my father has turned my act of treachery into the mercy seat where he embraces me in everlasting mercy. I think, I think that when Jesus was um, 
in John 18, shortly after the prayer, he looks up and here comes down the valley. I mean, this is three verses after he finishes his prayer. This is what John is saying to us. He looks up and he sees Judas. And Judas is flanked on one side by a Roman cohort, which is a thousand, five hundred to a thousand Roman soldiers in formation, he says, with lanterns and torches and weapons. And they're marching, and you can feel the whole valley shaking. And on the other side is the temple police, which were Levites. They get that. The Levites in bed with the Romans being led by a betrayer. And Jesus walks up and says, Whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus and Nazarene, because nothing good can come from Nazarene. And he says, I am, ego I me, the name of God in Isaiah, going all the way back to Exodus and Moses at the burning bush. And what happens? They fall out on the ground. And then, miraculously, Jesus is bound by the Romans and carted off, and then the whole process begins. And John's wanting all of us to read his gospel and say, well, wait, 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 How, what happened? All Jesus said was the name of God, who is who he is, and everybody falls out. The victory. But that's not a victory. That's not what Jesus is after. There's no knowledge of the Father in that. And so Jesus is saying to him, you can't take my life from me. You, Your murderous intention will only succeed by my submission to you. And therefore, I'm going to submit to you in your darkness and in your sin and in your grotesque collusion with the Romans in the betrayal of Judas. And I'm going to submit myself to that. My Father and the Holy Spirit are in me, and we're going in. And we're going to have a new conversation on the other side of this. And I, I, can't, I can't help but believe, that what, what did Jesus' face look like when he stood you know, three feet away from Judas in his betrayal? What what's going on with Jesus' face there? Is he afraid? I I think he winked at him. I, th I think he winked at Judas and said, and whispered, Judas, we accept your betrayal, and we will turn your betrayal into the salvation of the human race in all creation. How about that, redeeming genius? I think it is let all the earth be silent and see how God really is in Jesus. Submits to us in order to get inside our darkness and delusion so that we can see and know what he knows. And for everlasting, from here on out, live in the freedom of the Holy Spirit inside the darkness until there is no darkness no more. Mm. Come on, man. Beautiful, beautiful. You share a story in the essay about an experience that you watched unfold in an airport in Aberdeen back in the 80s. Uh, could you tell us that story and what it meant to you? Yeah, this this was my, I was a year into my studies with J.B. Torrance. I saw everything. I was trying to learn how to talk about it and, and what it meant. We were all wrestling and we... And my older brother was coming over to play golf. Well, he's coming to see us. He's, you know, but, but he and I both grew up playing golf together with our dad and granddad and brother. And so he was wanting to play some golf, too, in Scotland. And I was waiting for him in the airport. And I was reading newspapers, sitting down. And, and I happened to notice a, a young guy who was pacing. There was a bunch of people in the airport. And, and, and this was long before the days of you know security. Uh, so you could walk right up to the door that leads out to the plane. And waiting on somebody. So this young man was standing there looking. He'd look up at the arrivals monitor and he'd look at his watch. And I'm reading the newspaper, but I noticed him above all the people there for some reason. And before long, a plane, a jet landed and taxied over to the terminal and, and pulled up to the jet bridge and they opened the doors. And all these people started coming out of these double doors into the airport. Um, some of them were, you could tell, were, were Scottish and were coming home. Some were trying to catch the next flight and some were trying to figure out where the baggage claim was. And this man was standing you know, probably 20 yards in front of the double doors. And, and, and eventually nobody, there was nobody else coming out of the jet bridge. And he looked back up and looked at his watch. And then you could see through the window of the airport and through the window of the jet bridge, this little brown hair bopping up and down just above the windowsill. And this little boy comes and he stay, he stands 
uh, in the double doors and he's scanning the, the crowd like an alarmed deer. And then his father shouted something. I think it was his name. I don't remember what it was. The little boy saw his dad. He comes flying across that airport 20 feet in front of me, drops his bag, jumps up in the air, and his father catches him. And they hug each other. And I'm crying. And I'm like, wow. And right in that moment, this, this, this ticker tape again, which is both a ticker tape and a voice, uh, says Baxter. Baxter, that's the gospel. That little boy's my son. He's coming home from the far country. There's the resurrection. There's the ascension. There's our embrace. And the good news, Baxter, he has you and the whole world with him. And I just sat there, dumbfounded. And so I have told that story, Jason, uh, for 25 years all over the world. I tell it everywhere I go. And the, the very first time I told it, or one of the first times that I told it was in Australia. And there were 400 people in the room. I told the story at the end of one of the lectures, and I sat down on the front row with my friend Bruce and, uh, and David Qualick. And I hear this young girl coming down the aisle crying, Mr. Kroger, Mr. Kroger. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what did I do? And I've broken this little girl's heart. And all this shame stuff starts flying through your mind. Right. And she sits down beside me, and I put my arm around her. Her name was Stephanie. And I said, Stephanie, what is wrong? What is wrong, child? She said, oh, nothing is wrong, Mr. Kroger. I said, well, what's happening? Why are you crying? You know? And she said, when you told the story of the little boy in the airport, the Lord gave me a vision. I said, and what did you see, Stephanie? She said, I saw God on the throne, high and lifted up, and there were all these steps going up to the throne. And we were all on the steps trying to get to God, and we couldn't do it, and we were sad, and our hands were bloody, and knees and elbows were bloody, and we were just crying because we couldn't get to God. And I said, well, did you see anything else? She said, yeah, I saw Jesus. I said, what did, what did Jesus do? She said, Jesus came over, gathered every one of us into his arms, walked up the steps and sat down in the Father's lap. I said, Stephanie, that's the gospel. In that day, you will know I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. More light, Holy Spirit. More light. Turn the lights on. Help us to see what he is and deliver us from the evil of our religious delusions. When Jesus takes humanity into the lap of the Father, is he taking Judas with him? He's taking me with him and Judas and all of us and all creation. See, the, the, the New Testament speaks of of the death and resurrection of Jesus on creation level terms, the great palingonacea, the great recreation of all things in Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus. So yes, Judas is included, and I don't know where Jesus and Judas are in their discussion, but I would go so far as to say that the church is included, and we've hurt a bunch of people. We've damaged a bunch of kids and destroyed a bunch of marriages because of it, but we're included, and Jesus is sorting us through. So I think that when we die, uh, that we, we meet Jesus, the real one. And I, I would guess, speculate, that that meeting takes some time because we've got a bunch of stuff to undo. And I, w I won't speculate on how that meeting will turn out. Oh, that's why I'm not a universalist. I don't know how that meeting will turn out because Jesus is not going to violate our wills. But we learn in the event of death that we don't have the power of life. And we learn that he is the living one. And we learn that our whole life, what we call our life, has actually been a participation in his livingness, in his existence, in his uh, being the living one. Um, by all means, if Judas is not included, I mean, for real. <laughs> 
uh, if he's not included, what ch- what chance do the rest of us have? That's not mm-hmm. the way God operates. That's not the way mm-hmm. our Father operates. And and I often I often say, you know, I've grown up a Calvinist, and 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 I just I can pick it then because that's my people. But you know, I often say that the Calvinists are going to walk by the Father, Son, and Spirit and look for God in heaven for you know ten thousand years <laughs> before they finally realize. <laughs> They got they they got the God thing wrong and uh are confused and and so it it would not surprise me that when the Calvinists die that George McDonald is the one that meets them <laughs> and, and it wouldn't surprise me that when the, us religious types die that it's not it's not Peter but Judas that meets us mm, wow you know so I I I how ungracious. Would it be? Because God's not a user. And how ungracious would it be for God to use Judas for the benefit of the whole creation of the human race and leave him out of it? Right. Uh, or, or for that matter, Adam. You know? Yeah. So in, in the essay, I addressed the question of universalism. Uh, I, did, I don't think I, I, no, I did not address Adam per se. Usually it's Hitler that people ask me about. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and, and Hitler Hitler was participated in evil, uh, and then he me- he meets Jesus. And I don't know how that conversation turns out. Uh, I got my ideas, but uh, I don't know for a fact. Mm-hmm. But like I, I like to say, you know, it's easy for us to pick Judas and or Hitler or Mao Zedong or whoever we, you know, will pick that we think is the most evil of all, but the Christian church has done a lot of evil mm-hmm. in the name of Jesus. And that's where the judgment begins. The judgment begins with the household of faith. Mm. What is judgment but our salvation saving us from ourselves? Mm. Wow. I think I was so influenced for really my whole life by penal substitutionary atonement theory. I, I literally thought it was the gospel that I couldn't look at a picture of the cross without, you know, feeling shame and, and uh, regret. And, you know, I'm in trouble. If God ever really figures out who I am, uh, I'm, I'm really screwed. Um, but I guess it was Brad Jerzak that I first heard talk about another way of viewing the cross. And you certainly amplify that in this essay, this other way of seeing what's taking place at the cross. And if we can, If we can look and we can see that that's God looking at the people who are actively murdering him and saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Pleading ignorance on behalf of those who are currently engaged in his execution. Man, there's hope for me there. I didn't have any hope in penal substitutionary atonement. Well, there's no hope there. And it's uh, anyway, I. Um, we can we can have a whole segment on 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 that, but for me, I, I, it's much more productive to park where we are. And I remember one time we were doing communion, or, um, and they put the communion cup up on a table, and it had bread beside it. And we formed a line, and we were to come up and take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup, and it's called intinction. Uh, and and we take communion, so. You know, we're standing in line. It's my time to come. And I take a piece of bread, and right as I'm dipping it in the cup, I hear, he who dips with me into the cup is the one who betrays me. Mm. And then I hear, and I take your betrayal, Baxter, and turn it into your adoption. (laughs) And so, to me, to own the fact that I, too, participated in the betrayal and the cursing and the beating and the murder and the damning of the Word of God, the eternal Son of the Father, the anointed one, I, too, participated in that, and that my offering here is not my grand faith and faithfulness and my religiosity. My my offering here is treachery and apostasy, and Jesus took my treachery and apostasy and turned it into union. That, that is hope. Mm-hmm. That means that there's no dark corner in my soul that's not included in this. It means that no one is beyond the reach of Jesus. He's found us all. Now it's just us coming to know, us coming to know. And it's a big process. 
it's a big process. It's taken us 2,000 years in the West to begin to believe that the Trinity is important. <laughs> but, and I say, Jason, I mean, one of the things that I like to say to help us in this process a little bit is let's just say for the sake of argument that uh, history lasts another 50,000 years. That would mean that what we're, we're in right now is the early church. Mm-hmm. And something has happened that is so mind-boggling and so beautiful and so beyond our capacity to conceive of it and think of it. It's, it's happened in Jesus. It's taken us 2,000 years to, in the Western tradition uh, uh, to, to really, really see, and principally thanks to Karl Barth, uh, that this Trinity discussion is, is critical and beautiful. And I just think it's how, how astonishingly wonderful and beautiful it is. And this is where we are. This is where we are right now uh, in, in our family conversation. This is where we've come in our journey. We've got a bunch of people that are despairing, a bunch of Christians that are despairing because they've done what the preachers told them to do, and it hasn't given them freedom or life or a river of living water, and they don't know what to do about it. And you got a bunch of preachers that are defending their position, and then you also got a bunch of people that are recovering the ancient gospel and are having their minds blown and are liberated, liberated from their their toes to their earlobes by the light. And they can't be quiet about it. And um, it's just beautiful. I've seen, in 30 years, I've seen this go and grow and it's global and its conversation is deep and wide and beautiful and it's all centered on Jesus and his relation with the Father and the Holy Spirit and it's everywhere and it's liberating people and it instantly it instantly obliterates racism and all the isms because you can look at somebody whose face is lit up with hope that they too are included that they have seen Jesus embrace them in their murderous apostasy and there's hope written across their face. It doesn't matter what color they are, what background they come from, male, female, anything. That's my sister. That's my brother. We share, we share a, a mind-boggling love that Jesus knows from the Father from all eternity. And now we see it. This is love. Love is when is when we murder Jesus and Papa turns it into the reaffirmation and renewal of our union with Christ. That's love. That's redeeming genius of the Holy Spirit. That's hope. That that gives us something to believe. And it, it defuses the clutches of the evil one that we are not worthy. It, de, it, it defuses it. It declaws him. He's got nothing to say to us about all the things that we've done wrong when all those things have been pe- taken up in Jesus and you to restore union. Just, there's no power. There's, he can't shame us. Oh, and it's Luther. You know, he was great about this. He, he had these conversations with the devil. He making a list of all the things that the devil had said he had done wrong. And, and finally, the devil quiets down. And Luther says, is that all you know about me? Let me tell you something. And he fills out <laughs> more paperwork, you know. He says that now. And then he takes the whole wad of paper. And he's like, he hands them over to the evil one and says, but Jesus has embraced me. This Luther has been included in the embrace of the Father, mm-hmm. in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. So shut up. Be gone. So shame, and fear and shame is the evil one's tools. That's his weapons. That's the fiery darts. And both of them are taken away when you see yourself as participating in the murder of the Son of God and you see our Father in heaven turning that into the new covenant. <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, my God. I know it's- Mm. Mm. Uh, Dr. Kruger, I'm so grateful for the time that you've given us here today and, and for the heart that you've poured into this essay and to our conversation today. Um, what are you working on next? I know you mentioned another essay that is yet to come. What can we look forward to from you in the future? Well, um, number one, we've got 350 hours of teaching and about six or seven essays and nine books that are available right now. But what I'm working on at present is a number of things. First, the essay on the meaning of the death of Jesus in John's gospel, which is a lot of what we've been talking about. I'm also working on compiling a book of stories, uh, like my son is budding the den and and, uh, what I saw in the airport. And the Lord has just given me some beautiful, wonderful stories through the years. I'm going to compile that. 
and I'm working on the sequel to Patmos, <laughs> which is uh, is going to be a ripper. Uh, it's not going to be uh, two men in a cave uh, trying to, to one trying to lead the other to healing. This is going to be more of a of a mystery th- thriller uh, from the get go. But I will say that it's all about it's all about Aiden returning with his wife and his best buddy uh, to Patmos on the on the 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 king of Greece's or the president of Greece's invitation because tourism has has, has just skyrocketed on Patmos because people are trying to find uh, the scroll that John may have left behind for for Aiden hmm. uh, and and they get as far as the airport when um, Aiden's wife is kidnapped by the bad guys and off it goes oh wow so Aiden is trying to figure out how to walk with Jesus through something like that and this buddy is um, it, it's it's a ripper. So those are those are things that I'm working on right now. Also, I'm working on. Um, I guess this will probably be an essay on the Trinity in the Old Testament and in the intertestamental period that I got into as background to John's Gospel and the prologue and trying to understand his use of the word "word" in the in the first verse, and discovered that there was a discussion of this. Um, it stretched all the way back. It goes all the way back to Abraham on the, in the Oaks of Memory, the, the three quote, quote unquote angels that appear, one of whom is named Yahweh. And what's that all about? And is there a real discussion here? Oh, yes, there is. That all originated 25 years ago when I'm driving down the road and I said, Lord, you're going to have to get the Jews in the Trinitarian discussion. And I don't know how in the world you're going to do that. And, and I didn't even finish this. And, and the Lord said, well, Actually, the Jews are already in the Trinitarian discussion, and they have been all along. And I'm like, well, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm like, you got to show me. And so he has, and I want to talk about that. And then, who knows? Um, I didn't know you until Keith introduced us. Uh, so I, I don't want to predict what's next. <laughs> I'm just doing. <laughs> it's kind of you, you get to be a child. You do when you know that Jesus is real and He's not absent but present, and He's in us with His Father and Holy Spirit. Then life becomes uh, Jesus. What are you doing, and how do you want me to participate? Oh, you want me to help fix that tire? Uh, oh, oh, you want me to pick up the phone? Or oh, you want me to to read with my grandchildren? Oh, you want me to cook supper? Oh, it, it's just you don't really know what's next, and it's beautiful because. We're not afraid that this is the world belongs to the Father, Son, and Spirit. What are you doing to redeem this? And uh, the last thing I want to do, or I think most Christians want to do, is uh, we don't want to work in the name of Jesus against what he is actually doing. And that's a big one. So I sometimes say that, um, that I spent most of my life, I think most people do, playing checkers. Uh, I don't mean the board game. I mean trying to get ourselves crowned or trying to get ourselves accepted or honored or recognized. And in the midst of our moves, which are always self-promoting and self-protecting and self-honoring, in the midst of our checker moves, the Holy Spirit, who is present, not absent, takes up our checker moves and self-centeredness and self-promotion and turns them into three-dimensional chess. And when you see that, you get real quiet and you think, I want to participate in the three-dimensional chess game. I'm not interested in checkers anymore. And the last thing I want to do, uh, and this is a word to all of us Christians, the last thing that we want to do uh, playing church is to actually be working against what the Holy Spirit is doing in the three-dimensional kingdom. Um, So we get quiet. That's the beginning of prayer. Uh, we're saying, Lord, show me what you're doing, and please don't let me work against you, and I want to participate, and I'm looking for you everywhere, sacred presence. You're not up there, you're here. And we're not moving from the absence of Jesus in his Father, in the Holy Spirit, to his presence one day in the future. We're moving from his presence now everywhere to its manifestation. Beautiful. Beautiful. What's the best way for folks to engage with you and your work online? Well, the, the website is perichoresis.org. Uh, uh, I'll spell it, P 
P-E-R-I-C-H-O-R-E-S-I-S dot org. If that's too much to handle, uh, that word, by the way, means it's, it's the one word summary of the doctrine of the Trinity. It means mutual indwelling without loss of personhood, uh, oneness. And uh, anyway, if, if that's too much, you can go just Google C period Baxter Kruger, K-R-U-G-E-R, and it'll have some links for you to the mothership. Um, uh, there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Uh, I don't even know, Jason, it's, I've been doing this so long. <laughs> it's like somebody sent me a, a link the other day to something I was doing. I, I think it was in Australia. It's probably 25 years ago or something. I was like, who is that guy? <laughs> 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 who is that guy? You know? So now I'm all gray headed. And, uh, but um, so there's a lot of stuff there. There's a bunch of free stuff on our website. And um, this class that uh, we, I just finished teaching online uh, called Introducing the Trinitarian Faith. Uh, we will be repeating it often. Uh, when you sign up for it, you'll get access to 11 lectures or 10 lectures and, and an interview that's beautifully filmed by Michael LaFleur. Three cameras shoot everything. You watch the interview, I mean, watch the, the lecture, and then we all get together at a certain time and talk about it. And the first one, we, did, we had 80 people from around the world. It was just awesome. So we'll be repeating that, and you can find out about that on our website. Where next is going to be in January in Australia. All right, I'm not going to Australia this time, but we're going to do it in their time zone. Then we're going to redo it in the United States or the Americas, which is Canada, USA, Mexico, and all, all in that time zone. But then there's also uh, every Tuesday, I mean, the first Tuesday of the month coming up next week, uh, is, uh, I do a live uh, Zoom cast called uh, Baxter Live Across All Worlds. And right now what we're doing, is, first it was just a discussion like we're having, and it's eventually uh, gravitated toward an ongoing discussion of John's Gospel. So we're now going to be starting Chapter 2 this Tuesday. But when you sign up for that, you get you get access to the recordings of all of them. So um, we're, we're doing that. Um, and I love that. That's, that's two of my favorite things that we're doing. Um, it's a beautiful time. Now, after a lot of years of, of um, pretty serious opposition, now it, things are just beautiful. People are opening. They want to know more. They see it. They, they don't have words for it. And that's what people say to me all through the years is, Baxter, I've known this. You're not telling me anything I don't know. No, you, I just never had anybody put it into words. Isn't that the best feeling in the world? Oh, man. If I didn't, I'll, I'll tell you this, and then I'll be quiet and let you go, because I know we've gone on a lot, a lot further than. But if I did not believe that the Father, Son, and Spirit were in every person on this planet before they know it, before they even believe it, and they got there through our corporate rejection of Jesus that I've been talking about. But if I didn't know that was true, hmm. and I would never open my mouth. Because it would then be up to me right. to convince you that I'm right. And then I got to play the mm -hmm. game of con keeping you convinced that I'm right. And uh, uh, no, my job is to bear witness and let Jesus self-authenticate the message inside of you. Let the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit that this is true. And then it's a different conversation. Sure. And that's beautiful. And I don't want anybody to agree with me theologically. I want them to meet Jesus. And so a beautiful way to end our discussion is simply this. Ask Jesus. This is in the essay too, by the way. And, and feel free, Jason, send it to all your people or make it available. But, um, Ask Jesus these three questions. First, Jesus, are you in me? Second, Jesus, has your Father accepted me as I really am in my darkness? Third, Holy Spirit, have you made me in all of my brokenness the temple where you delight to dwell? Wow. Friends, we're going to link to the essay that we've been discussing, as well as Baxter's website, 
Uh, if you're in the Messy Conversations Facebook group, we're going to put a link to the essay where you can go directly to it from there. I really do encourage you to read it. it it's just life-changing stuff. As Baxter said, it may be something that resonates, something you already knew, but you finally will have words and a framework around what you've always felt was true. Dr. Kruger, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed it. It's been such a gift having this conversation with you. My pleasure, Jason. And the Lord bless you beyond your wildest dreams, brother. Thank you, brother. <laughs>